Hello and welcome to 7 Days of Science, your weekly source for the latest science news. In the headlines this week, evidence that Neanderthal cannibals were specifically targeting small women and children has been uncovered, the first potential instance of wolves using tools has been documented, scientists have learned that pigeons can detect the Earth's magnetic field thanks to a compass-like system in the inner ear, and much more. Our top story this week is a new paper that presents evidence suggesting that some Neanderthals were highly selective cannibals, seemingly targeting specific groups of other Neanderthal people to prey upon and consume. The new research that led to this revelation examined Neanderthal bones uncovered from a site in southern Belgium, known as the Goyat Caves. These caves contain an extensive assemblage of Neanderthal bone fragments, many of which display cut marks on them, characteristic cuts inflicted by the tools of other Neanderthals. However, due to the fragmentary nature of many of these bones, it has taken a while for a more complete understanding of who these people were to be developed. This new research combined various approaches including paleogenetics, isotopic composition, anatomy and structural analysis of these bones to reveal who the targets of this cannibalism were. And what they found is quite intriguing, if also rather chilling. The study states that the overrepresentation of short, morphologically gracile, non-local females alongside two immature individuals suggests a strong selection bias in the individuals present at the site, basically meaning that uh, these Neanderthals were eating small women and children from elsewhere. Lovely. The researchers note that the identities of the targeted individuals are far too specific for this to have been a coincidence, so the Neanderthals who butchered them were deliberately going after smaller people. Not only that, but the isotopic data show that the cannibalized people were not from this region and had been born outside the Goyette area. So this is an example of what the researchers call exocannibalism, predation by one group of Neanderthals upon another distinct group of these people. The individuals who were butchered were not close genetic relatives to one another, but they do all share similar isotopic signatures, suggesting they originated from the same foreign location. The remains all date from between 41 and 45,000 years ago, a period marked by a notable diversity of different Neanderthal cultures. It's hypothesized in the paper that perhaps this period of diversity meant that coexisting Neanderthal populations of the time were not interacting very much with each other, leading to each community viewing the others as different from them in key aspects. In addition, although the presence of Homo sapiens has not yet been confirmed in the Goyette region at this point in time, they were definitely present in other locations across Europe, such as at a site to the east in Germany. Perhaps then, the arrival of Homo sapiens, along with other factors such as perceived differences between Neanderthal groups, might have led to a surge in competition between human populations in the region, which could have resulted in the cannibalization of Neanderthal women and children from outsider groups. It's impossible to tell exactly why these women and children were targeted as prey, and it's also not clear if they were all killed at the same time or on various separate occasions. But the fact that the Neanderthals from Goyette were going after short-statured adult to adolescent women and children perhaps hints that the intergroup competition arising in late Pleistocene Neanderthal populations drove these cannibals to undermine the future reproductive ability of these perceived outsiders by taking away and killing key members of their group. It's a truly fascinating, if particularly dark, insight into life for prehistoric humans, and I'd recommend having a read of the full paper, which is openly available and will be linked down below if you'd like to learn more about it. Next up, we have a decidedly more wholesome Neanderthal story as a recent paper explores the evolution of kissing, finding that this behavior likely occurred in our prehistoric cousins. The researchers used a very romantic definition of kissing as a non-agonistic interaction involving directed intraspecific oral oral contact with some movement of the lips slash mouth parts and no food transfer. And under this definition, kissing behavior appears in many different groups of animals. The scientists gathered as much observational data as possible about kissing among primates and applied a method to reconstruct the evolutionary history of the behavior. Kissing, it turns out, occurs in most living large apes, except eastern gorillas. 
Tracing back the evolutionary history of all living primates that kissed to their last common ancestor, the researchers estimate that kissing arose in the ancestors of large primates sometime between 21.5 and 16.9 million years ago. Therefore, kissing an extinct human species seems likely. And there is additional evidence that Neanderthals may have kissed, since other studies have shown that they had similar mouth microbe strains to modern humans, indicating that, long after we diverged into different species, we continued to exchange these oral microbes. Although much more data is needed to refine many aspects discussed, it provides some fascinating new insights into the evolutionary history of this behavior. Also in the recent news, a very exciting new study was published documenting the first recorded instance of potential tool use by wolves. On the central coast of British Columbia, in the territory of the Hiltzok Nation, it was noticed that crab traps submerged underwater were repeatedly being damaged by something. After deploying remote cameras to discover the cause of this damage, remarkable footage was captured of a female wolf pulling the crab trap boy out of the water, dropping it on the beach, and then pulling the line up the beach until she retrieved the crab trap and gained access to the bait inside. Although it's understood that wolves are smart animals, this behavior suggests an even greater level of intelligence, since the wolf would have needed to understand that there was food beneath the water and comprehend the steps required to retrieve it. Whether she worked out how to do this through trial and error or by watching humans, it demonstrates an impressive degree of problem solving and planning. There's still some discussion as to whether it counts as true tool use, since the wolf didn't actually modify the tool itself, but some scientists argue that, in the broader sense of the term, this certainly qualifies. What an utterly extraordinary study. In other animal news, a study has been published this week that seeks to give some answers to the mystery of long-distance navigation in birds, specifically pigeons. It has long been suggested that many different animals can use the Earth's magnetic field for long-distance navigation, although this has been disputed. Various studies have revealed more and more about how this may work. For example, one in 2011 showed that magnetic fields could be triggering the bird's vestibular system, which also helps them stay balanced. Various experiments have been done since, like a study published in 2019 that showed that pigeons express a modified protein that allows them to sense the electric currents from magnetic fields, rather like sharks and skates. Well, in a study published this week, the team used single-cell RNA sequencing to reveal that this compass-like biological system is located in the inner ear of the pigeon. A high concentration of proteins sensitive to the electromagnetic changes of Earth was found in the RNA sequencing of the vestibular system, which gives the pigeon the sense of where it might need to go. By performing experiments on pigeons in a dark environment, the study also showed that the system was not reliant on light. A fascinating paper that has revealed yet more about one of the most fascinating mysteries of life on Earth. Moving back in time a bit again, there's some very exciting paleontology news. The first definite fossil of a multi-tuberculate mammal has just been discovered in South America. Multi-tuberculates are a very interesting lineage of now extinct mammals that lived from the Jurassic and survived the asteroid impact, dying out just 34 million years ago, and occupying many different kinds of niches across this time. Multi-tuberculates have previously been reported from landmasses that once made up the ancient southern supercontinent of Gondwana, such as Australia, Madagascar, and India. However, all fossils previously thought to be multi-tuberculates in South America have since been reclassified. Now, an unambiguous tooth fossil from one of these little beasts has been discovered in 64 to 69 million year old late Cretaceous rocks in Argentina. Named as a new species, Notopolythes jolis, <laughs> the tooth has three rows of tetrahedral cusps, a very typical multi-tuberculate feature. This species not only proves that this mammal group was indeed present here, but it also adds to the evidence suggesting that multi-tuberculates in Gondwana may not have made it past the end of the Cretaceous, when the dinosaurs went extinct. Although they did survive many millions of years later in the north. Another fascinating new discovery. We also have a new dinosaur species named this week. Excitingly, it's a new kind of extremely long-necked sauropod dinosaur from the late Jurassic of China, which lived about 161 million years ago. Known from a single partial skeleton, it's actually a new species of the already named dinosaur genus Mamenchisaurus, called Mamenchisaurus sangiangensis. This now brings the total number of Mamenchisaurus species to a whopping eight. Mamenchisaurus is an especially iconic dinosaur due to the absurd length of the neck, and this new species is no different. The paper also explores some interesting implications for how the sauropod lineage maintained dominance in East Asia, before the East Asian and European subplates 
recoupled later in the early Cretaceous. In other prehistoric news, a study has shown that the iconic feathered dinosaur Anchiornis, despite possessing wings, was most likely flightless. Anchiornis huxtii is a small, four-winged feathered dinosaur that lived 160 million years ago in the late Jurassic of China. It has long been controversial in regards to whether or not it could fly, as well as how it's related to other dinosaurs. In this new research, paleontologists examined the structure of this dinosaur's wings by analysing nine different specimens and observing how the feathers molted. The wing structure of Anchiornis and its feathers do not seem consistent with an ability to fly. Moreover, its molt strategy suggests it was flightless, since it had an irregular molt, meaning that the primary flight feathers in the wings were unpredictably replaced. This molting pattern is seen in some modern flightless birds, such as the flightless cormorant, and makes them look very scraggly indeed. So it might be that Anchiornis is an example of a secondarily flightless feathered dinosaur, having evolved from a flying ancestor, explaining why it has so many primary feathers in the first place. However, more fossils would be needed to confirm this. Another excellent new paper then. In other news, we have a little bit of a contrasting study to something we reported on a couple of months ago. Back in August, a paper was published that detailed how chemical compounds on Earth that are essential for life could not have formed on the planet itself, because it was too close to the Sun. Instead, these must have been brought here by things like asteroids that formed further out in the solar system and collided with Earth. The authors posited that Thea, the large protoplanet that hit Earth early in its life in a collision that formed the Moon, could have formed in the outer solar system with these life-necessary materials and brought them here. Well, an international study published this week has examined rock samples from Earth and the Moon, taking a look at the iron isotopes within these samples. It's thought that different iron isotopes will form in different parts of the solar system, and using their analysis, they concluded that all of Thea's material and most of Earth's originated from the inner solar system, and that Thea may have formed even closer to the Sun than Earth. It'll be interesting to see how this affects research like the paper we saw back in August. Also in the news, a recent oceanographic feature was published, highlighting the rapid escalation of industrial krill fishing around the Antarctic Peninsula. This year, after just seven months of fishing, fleets reached the 620,000 tonne catch limit, triggering an automatic closure of the fishery. Scientists monitoring the fishery documented up to 14 super trawlers from Norway, China, Chile, South Korea and Ukraine, operating in tight clusters near the coast, right beside prime whale and penguin foraging grounds. What shocked researchers and NGOs was how early this happened. Many expected the catch limits to be reached three to five years from now, not halfway through 2025. But the global krill industry, which is driven largely by rising demand from salmon farming, pet food and omega-3 supplements, has intensified dramatically over the past 15 years, and scientists are now seeing warning signs of the devastating effects this is having on this fragile ecosystem. Krill are the foundation of the Antarctic food web. Baleen whales, penguins, seals, and countless other species rely on dense swarms of these tiny crustaceans to fuel migrations, sustain pregnancies, and raise their young. If you want to learn more about the issues surrounding krill trawling, there's a video coming out this Sunday on my mum's channel, One World. Finally for the news, this last week also saw the conclusion of the COP30 talks in Belém, Brazil, where representatives from around the world met to discuss climate change action. It seems that once again the summit fell short of achieving many of the goals and actions needed to curtail the effects of anthropogenic climate change, with fossil fuel giants able to stand in the way of developing a roadmap to phase out fossil fuels, despite the world being on the brink of several crucial tipping points for natural systems. Much criticism has been leveled at the nature of the conference itself too, with calls to restructure it in future iterations to better meet the world's changed political conditions. Despite the many failures of this year's COP, it does still show that there are those committed to fighting for a livable planet for people and the natural world alike. But as always, more needs to be done if targets such as those set by the 2015 Paris Agreement are to be met. If you're interested in finding out more about the details of COP30, please do have a look at the sources below. Well, that's it for the news this week. I really hope you enjoyed learning about everything that's happened in these last seven days of science. Before we go, I want to introduce you to this marvelous guy here, Boris the Borealopelta. We've been working with the wonderful people over at Plush Foundry to bring you a scientifically accurate colored Borealopelta plushie, complete with counter shading that features a reddish brown upper surface, and a lighter underside, similar to what the real dinosaur would have had. But we need your help to make Boris a reality and to fund the campaign to get Boris made 
and sent out to everyone who ordered one. Be sure to check out the link in the description below if you'd like to get your own Boris and spread the word. Look how round he is. <laughs> I love him. You can follow 7 Days of Science on Instagram and also be sure to support us on Patreon if you enjoy what we do here. As always, a big thank you to our patrons including Andrew Kawam, Kang Yin, Chippy Chippy Chapa Chapa, Clara Middleton, Dean A. Bather, Diana Hernandez, Drav Srivastava, Gabriella, Gary Arrington, Giotist, I Rage, Euron Zydovic, John French, Joseph Ree, Josh Lambert, Corey Peterson, Lena Rose, Mark Nevin, Matt Grandis, Mendicant Friar, Mike Pace, Monitor Man, Nicholas Jork, Ralph Balzac, Robert Preprajika Jr., Robert Thomas, Sammy Petrikas, Steve Bradshaw, Thomas F. Conroy III, Timothy N. Tedrow, Tracy Merrifield, and Troy Schmidt. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week. Can't believe I did that all in one take. It's the power of Boris. <laughs> I threw it, and then midway through throwing it, I was like, oh no, it's going to hit the camera. <laughs>